getting somewhere in the mid 18th century, we find a phrase that was used in English literature, a phrase that uh, we sometimes still use today. It is a phrase that is used to describe someone who we think is acting in an irrational way, someone who we believe has gone too far in their thinking or in their behavior. And in our opinion, that person gives the appearance of being almost insane. So we sometimes say that they have gone stark, raving mad, that they could be no further away from reason, that they have gone beyond the bounds of logic and of a sound and a well-balanced perspective on life. And while this evaluation can certainly be true sometimes, many times it is applied to those of us who follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes people say that we have gone stark, raving mad, that we are over the top. And sometimes those comments come from those who, who are of this world, from those who do not know or belong to the Lord, and we expect that from those people. But there are other times when those comments come from those who claim to believe the truth. And it is in Acts chapter 26, in verses 19 through 32, that we find that this was the conclusion of a Roman governor by the name of Festus when he heard the Apostle Paul explain why he was willing to go to Rome and to stand trial for his faith. And as Paul stood before this governor, and he stood before a, a Jewish king named Agrippa, and he stood before an auditorium full of the prominent leaders and the influential men in the city of Caesarea. Paul took this opportunity to explain how the Lord had directed his life over the years. How at a young age, he had been educated in the religion of the nation of Israel. He had been educated in the city of Jerusalem and how zealous he had been to follow that religion so much so that he fiercely persecuted those who claimed that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Messiah, the Christ of God. But, Paul further explains. His life was turned around. His life was turned upside down when he was on his way to the city of Damascus to root out those followers of Jesus who might be there and to bring them back to Jerusalem so they could stand trial and face severe punishment, when suddenly, Paul says, a blinding light from heaven surrounded him, and he was thrown to the ground in great fear. And then Paul explains, I heard a voice. I heard a voice from heaven. And when I asked who he was, who was speaking to me, he said that he was Jesus of Nazareth. How could that be? Jesus had been crucified, but the fact is he had risen from the dead and he was alive in the glory of heaven. 
And even though Paul says, I had persecuted him, even though I had persecuted his followers, now, through his blood, through his death, he offered me forgiveness for my sins, which were, were many. And he gave me the opportunity to serve him. The opportunity to testify to the truth, to bring the message of salvation to the Jews, to the Gentiles, to everyone who would listen to those words. The opportunity to preach, to tell the people that salvation, the forgiveness of sins, deliverance from our offenses, the hope of eternal life in heaven can be found, and it can be found by you, and it can be found by faith, by faith in Christ Jesus alone. For by grace we are saved, it says in Ephesians 2.8, through faith and not of ourselves, it is, in fact, the gift of God, the gift of God in Christ. And Paul says, yes, I was entrusted with this message. I was set apart by God. I was set apart to be his voice. Consequently, Paul says in verse 19. After you have heard what has happened to me, what else could I do, King Agrippa? What else could I do? I did as I was instructed by the Lord. I did not prove to be disobedience, he says, apethes. In Greek, I did not ignore his command, a command that was given to me. I was knocked off my feet by God himself, and so I was compelled to respond to that heavenly vision. What choice did I have? Because obedience... Obedience is the essential mark of those who belong to Jesus Christ. We are to obey him, we are told in 1 John chapter 2. And Jesus himself said in John 14, 15, If you love me, then you will keep my commandments. So what else could I do? Immediately, says in verse 20, Paul expressed his obedience. How? By declaring, apangelo, by preaching the word, by announcing the good news of Jesus, both in the city of Damascus, first there, it says, and also at Jerusalem and throughout the entire province of Judea and, he says, even to the Gentiles in three journeys that he made throughout the Roman world. A life given to Christ that spanned the course of over 20 years. And what was his message? Paul tells us in verse 20. He says, I brought this message to everyone, the same message that we are to bring today. And what is that message? Verse 20 says that they should repent. Metanoeo in Greek. They should face their sin, and call it like it is. It is sin. And then they should turn from their sin, from their unbelief. They should turn from their self-righteousness, and they should turn 
to God in Christ. And Paul says, performing deeds, ergon in Greek, living a life appropriate to repentance. Axios, a life that has weight, a life that has the evidence of our faith, validating our words by our actions. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, by their fruit, by the fruit of their life, you will know them. Who we really are, our true character, will eventually be revealed by what we do. It will be revealed by how we live. For this reason, Paul says in verse 20, hen henika in Greek, because, because I was living in obedience to Christ and faithfully bringing the message of salvation to the people of this world, submitting myself to him, to God, submitting myself to the instructions that I had been given by the risen Christ. Because I was doing that, he says, some unbelieving Jews seized me in the temple in Jerusalem. Su lambano in Greek, they took me as their prisoner. And, he says, they tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help, Epikuria in Greek, assistance, having received assistance from God through the way he orchestrated the circumstances, through the people he brought into my life, in this way, the Lord delivered me. He delivered me from the lion's mouth. And so, by the grace of God, I still stand, Paul says. I stand firm. I am confident of the truth of the message that I proclaim even to this day. Over all of these years, the Lord has been by my side. And so I continue, he says, testifying to the truth, both to the small, mikros, in Greek, to the weak, to the insignificant, to the unknown people of this world. And I affirm the truth to the great, megas, in Greek, to the well-known people, to the notable people, to governors and to kings. But, Paul says, the fact is, everything that I am preaching, everything that I am stating, is really nothing, nothing new. Or even contrary to the scriptures. But, he says, I am only saying what the prophets of the Old Testament and what Moses said. They all prophesied hundreds of years ago. But they prophesied what was going to take place, what in fact has already taken place. Read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah chapter 53, for example. There we are told that the Christ was to suffer, he was to endure pain, and he was to die for us as a sacrifice, as the Lamb of God, as he's pictured in Exodus chapter 12. And that by reason, Paul says in verse 23, ek in Greek, out of his resurrection from the dead, a resurrection which is spoken of in Psalm chapter 16, the result of this would be that he would be the first Protos, the preeminent one, the first 
to rise from the grave, never to die again. The one who was to proclaim light and revelation and understanding and deliverance, which is offered, Paul says, to both the Jewish people and, as it says in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 49, he even would bring light to the nations, to the Gentiles, the light of the knowledge of the grace of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, while Paul was still saying these things in his defense, even before he had finished speaking, we are told that the Roman governor Festus could keep silent no longer. Did Paul really believe that this Jesus who had been executed was alive? Did he really believe that this Jesus was speaking to him from heaven? Well, that was too much for Festus to believe. And so we are told he cried out and he said in a loud voice, Paul, Paul, you are out of your mind. Minomai in Greek. You seem to be insane. You are stark, raving, mad. Your great learning and your extensive education and all of your study is driving you mad. Mania in Greek. You are in a frenzy. You, you've lost touch with reality. The wheels of your head are spinning in the wrong direction. The way that some people feel about us. Because we follow Jesus Christ. They think that the wheels of our head are spinning in the wrong direction. That we are throwing our lives away. But, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 1.18, this is because of the simple fact that the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. When we evaluate ourselves, when we elevate our way of thinking above the word of God. We are in effect saying that his word, his way is foolishness, that we have the answers that he does not have. Are we really willing to say that? Are we really willing to say that what God has ordained in his word is nonsense and has nothing to say that is reasonable or reliable? Many people take that approach today. You know, but it is only when our eyes are truly open to the reality, the reality of our sin, which is against God that we will see the necessity for the death of Christ to pay for that sin. Then it no longer is foolishness to us, is it? And so Paul, verse 25, respectfully responded to these foolish words of this Roman governor, and he said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth, sophra sume in Greek. These are sound words. These are sensible words. These are not the words of a man who has lost his mind. 
for the king, King Agrippa, who is there with you, Festus. He knows. He understands these things. He is acquainted with these matters. I call him as my witness. He can testify to the truth of what I say. And so I speak to him also with confidence. Pare si adsomai. I speak freely laying these things out before him. Since I'm persuaded, I truly believe that none of these things escape his notice. The Lamthano in Greek. These things are not hidden from him. He has a knowledge of these things. For this death, this resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, has not been done in a corner, Paul says, gonia in Greek, in a secret place. This claim by those who follow Jesus, the claim of his resurrection, is common knowledge among the people. And now Paul directly confronts the king and says in verse 27, King Agrippa, do you believe the words of the prophets that are found in the scriptures? And for a moment, Agrippa's silent. He doesn't say anything. So Paul answers his own question. And he says, I know that you believe them. And Agrippa finally replied to Paul with perhaps uh, what was a, a sarcastic remark, or maybe it was a deflection just to avoid the truth. And he said, in a short time, oligos, with a little more effort, you will persuade even me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God. Yukamai, I pray, I pray that whether in a short time or in a long time, not only you, but also all who hear my words this day in this auditorium might become such as I am a follower of Jesus who has been saved by grace, like me. He says, except for these chains. And what's the implication of this? Well, I think perhaps the implication is that you think you are free. You think that I am the prisoner, but I am the one who is free. I'm free in Christ and you are still in bondage. You are in bondage to your sin. And I suppose that was enough for the king to handle. So it says in verse 30, he arose and the governor along with him. And of course, Bernice and those who were sitting with them. And when they had drawn aside to a private place, they began talking to one another and saying, this man, whether he is sane or whether he is insane, he's not doing anything that is worthy of death or, or even of imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free. He should have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So once again, Paul has been found innocent not guilty of all charges, but there was no one there that day who had the courage, no one who had the moral fortitude to release him. But 
Even this was a part of the plan of God. This was part of his sovereign plan, wasn't it? After two years of being imprisoned in Caesarea, it was time for the word of the Lord to be fulfilled. Remember that word that was given to Paul by Jesus? Acts chapter 23, where Jesus appeared to him in a vision at night and stood by his side and he said to Paul, Take courage, for as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause in Jerusalem, so you must also witness at Rome. Everyone around us may think that we are stark, raving mad. But if we are leaning on the Lord, if we are resting on the truth of his word, then we too can take courage because we are the most sane person in that room. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.